I'm the Grub Street Lodger and here are my thoughts on what I read this month. I started the month off with Vox by Christine Dauka or Doucher. Now, I was very intrigued by some aspects of this book. I very much like the idea of the counter. In this book, uh, women need to wear a counter on their wrist and they're allotted a hundred words a day and then when they reach a hundred words, if they say any more, they get electrocuted. Uh, and the idea is to encourage women not to speak. And it's symbolic, to be honest, because it's all about, the book's all about uh, repression of women's voices. But in the book, it's also literal. And I really like this idea, not because I think it should happen, but because it was interesting. And this whole notion of uh, having to choose what you say and restrict what you say was really good. And I was very interested in the family dynamic of the book. And so in the book, this has only been going on for about a year. And the the um, mother of the household is finding it very hard to get used to, as you can imagine. And and uh, it's changing the way she's seeing her family. Uh, she's beginning to uh, resent her sons. Uh, there's one son. Um, he's sort of approaching... 18-ish, who she's beginning to fear because he's beginning to get really into the, the whole regime that's set this whole thing up. Uh, she really resents her husband. She's beginning to really dislike her husband because, one, he's a science advisor for this government, which is a bit odd, but also he, um, even though he, he shows clearly that he he's doesn't agree with these things, um, he's, he's weak and he, he doesn't you know, fight against them. And then most interesting is with her daughter. Her daughter, who was this vivacious, bubbly, talkative person, and is now sort of proud of not being able to talk because uh, she's about six and she's going to school and she's getting rewards for not talking. But also there's a bit where her daughter draws a picture of them all. And she draws the dad, the 18-year-old, the two 11-year-old twins, the mum and her, and it's like, the order of their importance and the mum is also shorter and her you know the children's view of the mum is changing the mum's becoming less important and all of that was very interesting trouble was it didn't work <laughs> the whole um dystopian thing didn't work because uh well it's set a few years in the future maybe uh Obama is living memory in this book. So they're in America. Uh, Obama's living memory. Somehow, the Christian right have become all in, you know, all powerful. And also, the, the Christian right's view of solving problems is to make women not talk. That doesn't really seem... Because it's so... Because it's not ages in the future like Hamid's tale. It doesn't seem very believable. Uh, and you start asking questions of how it would work in a way that you don't with Handmaid's Tale, because Handmaid's Tale is set in a distant future where things could have changed, uh, specifically society. And also Handmaid's Tale is set after some unspecified apocalypse, which would prompt change. This is supposedly, essentially now. And you just think, you know, your book of It Could Happen Here is really, really damaged by the fact that it could not happen here. Specifically, as an English person, it could not happen here. Christian right could not get that much power. But also, in even in America, it could not happen there. Um, there is no way that, that a group could come to power and within a year shut all of women's liberty and make a fantastical sci-fi device that ensures they say no more than 100 words. And there's no real reason why they would. Uh, and then the book itself... Uh, the writer is a, a linguist, uh, and the book itself goes into linguistics in that she's being commissioned to write uh, to to do this scientific thing about scrambling women's brains to make sure that they can't speak or something that they might use on other countries, and the whole thing turns from interesting dystopian idea to nonsense. And so that was Vox, and it wasn't wonderful. The second book is Mrs. Jordan's Profession by Claire Tomlin. 
Now, Mrs. Jordan's profession was as an actor. And she started off in Ireland, and then she moved on to the Northern Circuit in England, and then she went down to Drury Lane. And actually, throughout her career as an actor, the, the things said about her were remarkably consistent. She was hugely popular. She was one of the most popular actors in Britain at the time. And it seems like she was very natural. They said that it seemed like she had thought of the words as she was saying them, rather than yeah, had learnt them. Uh, she had a phenomenally accurate laugh. You know, faking a laugh is very hard. And she had one that was not only real sounding, but infectious and brought audiences along with it. So she was a very skilled actor. She'd had uh, an illegitimate child in Ireland, a man who'd sort of forced himself on her. Uh, but then she'd mostly avoided scandal because she had a long-term partner and a guy called Ford who she had two children with. And then someone wouldn't, didn't catch her eye, she caught someone's eye. And this was William, uh, the future Duke of Clarence, and then the future William the... I can't remember the number, I think sixth, the one who comes after George um, the fourth. So future King of England, William, starts sort of showing her attention. And she uses this at first against this Ford guy saying, look, you've got to marry me. Please marry me. Um, and if not, I'm going to go off with this, this royal. And Ford didn't marry her. So she went off with William. And you think, oh, the actor and the king-to-be, this is going to be a kind of a raunchy story. It's not. It's tremendously domestic. They then spend the next 20 years setting up a house together, having 10 children together. And they send all these letters back and forth because Dora's still touring. and She's still off to Drury Lane to act. And he's trying to do some things to do with the Navy, but he never really gets his chance to prove himself. And these letters are remarkably domestic, all about the little things about their family. And it's clear that they are the two most important things in Dora's life, her profession and her family. Then Princess Charlotte, the heir to the throne, dies. We're left in this peculiar position where the many, many sons and daughters of George III and, and Queen Charlotte have children, but none of them have any legitimate ones. So William basically is like a starting gun. Who can conceive the next um, you know, king or queen? So William leaves the, her, and he leaves her so that the children all set up all right, and things like that, but he doesn't talk to her again, and he goes off to marry a German princess. She, she's devastated, because the family's really important to her, but she's still keeping all the children together, they're, they're now going off into the world, and uh, some of them are you know, getting married, and some are becoming soldiers and sailors, and but she's still writing letters and keeping everything together. But then her son-in-laws, she's given them access to her bank account, and they've just bled her dry. And the creditors come after her and she has to flee to France and now she can't act. And within a, within a year of that, she dies. Because the two mainstays of her life have gone. And it's a very sad story. And you really, really get on board with Dora. She's, she seems such a strong person. And she's so committed and dedicated as a mother and as a professional. Uh... That the way it ends up is, is is really, really very sad. And that's how it ends. And it's a very good book. Um, I recommend it. Yeah, Claire, Claire Tomlin, Mrs. Jordan's Profession. Now, after that, I read this book here called Abigail by Magda Jabo. And it's uh, came out last year, but it's a translated Hungarian book from the 1970s. And, it, you know, it's a really really good book this is another one on the oh this might be one of the best ones at the end of the year type books in some ways it's sort of like a school story like a Mallory Towers or a twins at St. Clair's or something um, the main character and she's not called Abigail Abigail is actually a, a statue the main character called Gina and she she's uh, about 15 she lives in Budapest and she is being slowly introduced to you know, the high life her um, her granny is introducing her to, to balls and she, she's got a bit of a fancy man and all of this but it's 1940 um, no it's not even 1940 it's 1943 I think 
and the war is going on around. You wouldn't tell from her, but the war's going on around, and her dad's a general. And one day she's just suddenly sent off to the eastern fringes of the country. It's actually not even Hungary anymore where she's sent off to, uh, to this very, very, very strict boarding school. Uh, and it's not an evil school. It's not a Lowood Academy. It's not you know, a school that starves its children, feeds them well. Uh, the facilities are wonderful. The clothes are well made, but everything is drab and ugly and has rules. And she has no freedom anymore. You know, she's always with someone whenever they leave the walls of the place. She's quite distraught about this and she's you know, upset. Um, and, well, it's not just that the rules come from without, from the teachers. It's it has a very strict culture within. The schoolgirls within have their own rules. And one of them is about marrying an object in the class. And so they all get an object to marry. And she's a given the fish tank to marry and she doesn't like it and she has a big strop and when she storms out the teacher's like what's going on and she's like I don't want to marry the fish tank and she reveals part of their whole secret world that they have and then she's ostracized from them and so it seems like a Mallory Towers but it's actually a much deeper story about conformity and about the benefits and the not benefits of conformity because there she is. She has to learn to conform both to the rules of the adults, but also the, the culture and the rules of the children in order to just get on. At the same time, she's in Hungary, which at the moment is conforming to this story that they're doing well in the war when they're really not. They're just on the edge of the Nazis taking over because the Nazis are so disappointed with their uh, success so far. Um, and actually, there's more. That's sort of what's really going on. Because uh, Abigail is a statue, and according to school rule, uh, school tradition, it helps out children who who need help. But then Abigail starts giving her instructions, and Abigail the statue is part of the anti-Nazi um, retaliation, the anti-Nazi group. And the question is, who is Abigail? And it's a really wonderful book because it's narrated from her point of view. And she's wrong about most things. You know, her view of the world, she doesn't, you know, she doesn't even understand that she's been sent off to this place for her protection. Uh, she's worried that her dad's got another girlfriend or a new wife. And there's none of that. He's sent her off because he's a member of the resistance and he's, he's packed her off for her protection. And she doesn't get any of that. And as she's trying to think of who around her would be this resistance figure, she just sees people very... She's a teenager. She sees people by the surfaces. She has no idea who it would be, even though actually to me as a as an adult reader it was really obvious uh, who the resistance member was. And the whole thing manages to have that charm of the um, of, of uh, schoolgirl, you know, Mallory Towersy type story. You know, the thing that people liked about early Harry Potters, you know, the, the small enclosed thing. Uh, at the same time, say some very interesting things about conformity, the strength of it, but also the weaknesses inherent in it and um, all of this. And it's a really, really wonderful book. If you can find it, I recommend it so much. That's absolutely wonderful. The next book I read was Agnes Grey by Anne Bronte. Now, I still feel a little sad that when I read The Tenant and Wildfell Hall, I didn't give it its full attention and the full amount it deserved because at the time there was a lot going on uh, outside to do with COVID and to do with Christmas, and I got rather distracted and I didn't give it its worth. I think I did with this one. And it's clear that Agnes Grey is not quite as good a book, because um, it's a bit too simple. The The story is very simple. Agnes Grey, her family fall on hard times. She becomes a governess, first in one place where the kids are right twats, and then the second place where the kids are still pretty horrible, but she meets this curate she finds quite interesting. Uh, and there's a love story developed there. And what I liked about The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, and what I like about this, is that Anne Bronte doesn't go for the melodramatic. You know, the love story is not a thing where her love calls across the moors or you know ghosts or any of that. It's just two slightly awkward people slowly coming together. It warms the cockles of the heart, but it doesn't exactly set the heart on fire. And it's a very subtle and well-observed book. And I think there was a lot of humour just, just 
bubbling along gently, a lot of slightly wry humour. I especially liked all the stuff about the position of the governess, because she's not part of the family, because um, you know she's being paid to do what she's doing, but she's also not part of the staff, because she needs to be somewhat of a gentlewoman in order to you know, teach the kids and have the education needed. So she's in nowhere place, and the servants don't respect her, and the family don't respect her, and the kids she has to teach don't respect her. Now, I think Agnes is probably quite a shit teacher, uh, you get the impression, because the kids don't respect her, and teaching kids who who are being told by their parents not to respect the teacher is really hard, because I work in a school and I've had this. It is very, very difficult, but she never wins them round, and in fact, with the first family, she stops even seeing the children as human, she just sees them as these squalling rage beasts that she can't communicate with, so I think she's not a great teacher, uh, but she does try, and she has, you know, <laughs> she has good intentions, <laughs> and and she falls in love, and it's, it was a very good book. I can see why it's not as good as Turn One for Hall, but reading it, I can see how much more I could have enjoyed Tenant or Wildfire Hall because it's it's really well observed and it's got this just slight shimmer of sarcasm running through it that I really liked. So that was that. Now the next two books uh, I read partly because I wanted to read them partly because I plan to do something about them on this channel. Uh, the first was Princess Caribou, Her True Story by John Wells. And John Wells was the guy who wrote the film Princess Caribou. And with the um, information he got for that and all the research he did, he also wrote this book. It's really interesting how he used that information for two different purposes, and that's what my video is going to be about. And so Princess Caribou was a woman who turned up um, near Bristol and she was a mystery because she didn't speak English and she had these very strange habits about her and and it began to be revealed or they began to feel or understand that she was a, a foreign princess from distant Java Sioux. Spoilers, she wasn't, she was from Dorset, um, no Devon and uh, she was just someone with a huge imagination who'd started playing this princess and and carried on and so the book is structured that the first bit is all about uh princess caribou almost as if there might be a princess and then we find out that she's a fake the second is all about her life beforehand um and she's called mary and she had a really really interesting life and actually if i was doing the film i'd do more about that she got involved in almost all the great charitable institutions of london at some point and just the kind of person who falls into pretending to be a foreign princess. I found her really interesting. And then the third section was mostly about John Wells' own uh, thing in writing the film, in writing the book, and in discovering, you know, things, finding, like, her ancestors and things like that. Um, and it was a really good book, and it told the story really well. There's just one thing I found a bit iffy about it. He keeps going on about how beautiful she is, and... Uh, and I, I think it's a bit weird when a biography keeps talking about the lovely eyes and firm breasts of the main character. I just thought he was getting a bit icky. Certainly he saw it as important that she was beautiful as the key to deception. There you go. So I followed that up by this, which is The Curious Tale of the Lady Caribou by Catherine Johnson. And it's a, a ya book, or young adult. Um... I've not read much nah! before, uh, and and it was interesting how they'd taken, it outright says at the back that the inspiration for this book is this book, and so how she'd taken it and shaped it. Um, some of the differences I found annoying, for example, she makes Mary black, or at least um, mixed race, uh, so that when people see Princess Caribou, they're like, oh, she's got darker skin, and one of the things about Princess Caribou is that she had very, very light skin, and it was one of the things that made people doubt her story. And Katherine Johnson does this to, um, I think, to, to get to talk about race, but she doesn't really talk about race. She just has people occasionally going, oh, she's dark. I didn't get that. And she also invents a backstory for Mary. Um, you revealed, in this, you revealed the whole way along that it's a hoax because you're in Mary's head half the time. Uh, but she invents this backstory that involves rape and that the whole Princess Caribou thing is um, 
sort of almost a traumatic response to this rape and the death of her her child um and that she's escaped into this character and that's how and why she's maintained this character about me which i think the trauma thing is quite interesting but the the history the one she's based the book on makes very clear there is no rape and there's no dead child and a little bit of it seems like drama for drama's sake there's enough real drama going on without this stuff i feel but I really did like how she dramatised being Mary and being Caribou. How how Mary uses Caribou as this way of um, escaping herself and her life. And how she's acting, she's thinking, oh, well, I'm a princess now. I don't need to you know, be ashamed of who I am because I am a princess. And how Caribou is almost like self-therapy. It was really interesting. And then there's this whole uh, love story with um, the family that takes her in, son and things. And it was a good book, but I felt, I felt you could see it being shaped. It was being shoved into the yar uh, mould, and it didn't completely want to fit. I think a better telling of the caribou story would be a bit more sprawling and not have quite so many invented details, to be honest. Now, the next book I read was The Lodger by Marie Belloc Lowndes, who incidentally is the sister of Hillier Belloc, the, um, the official poet of Sussex. Um, and this is a book mostly famous, I think, because Alfred Hitchcock, his one of his big silent films was of this. It was written in 1913. It's about this family called the Buntings. Well, they're a couple, and they were servants, but now they're running... Uh, house for people to lodge in and people aren't coming and they're getting really really poor they they reckon they're about three weeks away from utter destitution because there's no social services or anything in 1913 and then there's a knock on the door and it's a slightly creepy man who pays in gold so they're pleased yes we've been saved from from utter ruin but this man who wants to rent all our rooms and he's a little bit weird you know he creeps out at night and he's quite private, and he, he's quite changeable in his mood. And I occasionally hear him reading really misogynist bits of the Bible out loud to himself. But hey, he's paying. Oh, and there's a serial killer going about called The Avenger, who kills women who drink uh, and does horrible things to them. We never actually find out what horrible things. We just find out they're horrible. Uh, this is instantly one of the first fictional, overt fictional descriptions of Jack the Ripper. Um, in fact, the book was inspired when Marie Belloc Lowndes was at a dinner party with some people who um, who claimed that their cook and butler had been, you know, had had a lodging house themselves and had reckoned that, you know, Jack the Ripper had stayed with them for a bit. Um, and it really builds up the tension, especially when the teenage son of... of uh, son? Where did that come from? The teenage daughter... Um, from first marriage of the uh, the man in the relationship comes and stays and they're like, oh God, is, is he going to kill her? And it builds and it builds and then it kind of fizzles out. The ending's a bit rubbish. But it's as a psychological thriller and it's a very, very early example of the kind. It's really tense. Uh, and and you're just locked in Mrs. Bunting's head as she, she has this secret that she doesn't even know if it is a secret. She You know, she's not certain the lodger is an evil serial killer but she's pretty sure of it and she doesn't know what to do and it's a really good book the last book i read this month um i was a bit scared of i indeed feared virginia wolf because this is virginia wolf to the lighthouse and i'd heard lots of things about how hard to reach she is and how unclear and how all these technical things make it fuzzy and in some ways, it's all true. Like, you are sort of zoomed straight into the story. It's more like swimming through a story rather than seeing it from above. But I didn't find it unclear at all. And what's more, I found it way more warm and humane than I was expecting. It was a really um, personal book. And it was a really well-observed book. It was not vague at all. There was loads of very, very well-observed details. You got a clear sense of... The many characters of the book, some of the 
children of the book get a little bit vague, but the many characters of the book. So even though, and I had no idea why do modern modernist novels not want to attribute dialogue. I really don't see that. It doesn't break the flow. It annoys me, but even though dialogue's not attributed, you know who it's to because each of the characters does have their own um, set of hobby horses, like in Tristram Shandy. They have their own ideas. They have their own obsessions. Uh, they have the thoughts that go around their minds. So when it does, the point of view does slip out of one head and into another and all of this, it's still very possible to follow. And I loved some of the little um, details of this. And in fact, I thought it was quite funny, bits of it. I thought the first two pages, because I was unsure, I read the first two pages and I was sold, because there's this very short two sentences, we're going to go to the lighthouse, um, Mrs, Mrs, um, I've forgotten her name, Ramsey, I only finished it yesterday, <laughs> Mrs Ramsey uh, was was all ready to, uh, it was, was sorting stuff out, and then there's this big page long thing of her son being excited about going to the lighthouse and how he was a very emotional person and everything, was his emotion coloured everything and how he was so excited, everything seemed rosy and golden and wonderful and then you turn the page and his dad go, no we're not, it's going to rain tomorrow. And it's like set up in a joke and I thought, well that's, that's way more entertaining. I had always assumed from what I've heard that Virginia Woolf doesn't like to entertain, she likes to experiment and explore but no, that was that was really entertaining. And then the next paragraph, where the, the kid imagines getting an axe and plunging it in the dad. And I thought, well, that's quite shocking. And it carried on throughout. It was a very entertaining book. And it was a very um, moving book by the end. Uh, so the story is essentially, the first chunk is they want to go to the lighthouse. Um, and there's a discussion because it might not be very nice weather. And it's sort of the evening. Um, then there's a chunk chunk called time passes where everything changes over about 10 years and then there's a chunk where they've all come back to this place uh, and some of them have gone off to the lighthouse finally uh, and it's very moving because it never is overt what the lighthouse means and what every symbol means because it's not they don't work exactly as symbols but it's clear that to the to the dad he really wants to get to this lighthouse as a memory of his wife who's died in that little section. And she's prevalent at the beginning and she's really missed at that end. At the same time, there's this painter called Lily Briscoe who's always fighting her demons while she's painting. Um, and she finally cracks his painting at the end. And those two things are sort of cut between each other, them getting to the lighthouse and her cracking this painting. And it comes together with this glorious sort of moment of achievement and you know we might be individuals lost and alone but we can connect at times and we can achieve things and we can communicate it might not be the most perfect communication you know but we can through uh, words but more through actions through deeds through painting through through you know writing and structured things and it comes at this really strong thing so I really loved it um, and I'm definitely going to read some more Virginia Woolf quite soon. And that was my month. And thank you very much.